Grace Point Church, they, they're intolerant. They're judgmental. They have no compassion. And, you know, well, what did they do? They kicked me out of the church for committing adultery. Let, let them tell the story. You know, they, 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 they wouldn't let me have relations with my secretary. They wouldn't let me do drugs. They, 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 they told me it was a sin for me to, to, to shoplift at Walmart and, and so on. I mean, if we're going to have a bad reputation, let's have a bad reputation for doing the right thing. Being puffed up is the wrong reaction. What's the right reaction to sin? Mourning. Verse 2, that he that hath, excuse me, verse 2, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. The proper reaction to sin is mourning. Why do we mourn? Because we've got lost fellowship now. We don't cheer when we have to vote to exclude somebody from the membership because they have engaged in one of these practices. We're not happy about that. We'd rather not do it. We drag our feet to get to that point. We have conversations with them and we plead to them for a long time before we get to the point of voting to exclude and exercise church discipline or take church discipline rather to its final step which is the exclusion of the person from the church membership. We don't want to get to that point, but when we get to that point, we mourn over the lost fellowship. We miss the people that leave this church. Mourning over the destruction that will soon take place in that person's life. You look in verse 5. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. We mourn over the destruction that that's going to happen in that person's life, and destruction is going to happen in that person's life. If they insist on continuing in the sin unrepentantly, that sin is going to bring about destruction. I talked to you all this morning about the broad way and the narrow way. You go down that broad way, your life is going to be destroyed, and that's the direction that that unrepentant sinner is going. They're going down the path of destruction, and we mourn that. And we mourn that because we know that the destruction is coming, and we know that Satan likes to destroy the lives of believers. 1 Peter 5 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And when you've got this unrepentant sinner in the church, and you've gone, you've talked to him, and, and you've explained that the activity that he is engaged in is a sin, he says, well, I don't think you ought to be judging me. And so you go back with two or three others, and you, and you say, you know, this activity that you're engaging in is a sin. And, well, I don't think y'all should be judging me. And you go before the church, and you say, the activity that brother so-and-so is engaged in is a sin. And the church says, yes, we concur, this is a sin. And the person says, well, I don't think you ought to be judging me. And so you have to vote to exclude them. What you have done is you have removed the protective hedge from around them, and you have effectively delivered them unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And so you mourn that because their life is going to be destroyed. But remember, the goal is for his life to fall apart so that he will fall on his knees, repent, and cry out to God for forgiveness, and we can restore him to the fellowship. But it's going to be a long, hard process to get there, and we mourn that. That's the proper reaction to sin, is to mourn. But suppose we have this unrepentant sinner. What do we do with this unrepentant sinner? Verse 5, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. How do you deliver him to Satan? Verse 13, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. It means to remove him <coughs> from the fellowship of of the church. Remove him from the fellowship of the church so that Satan can destroy his flesh so that he'll come to repentance. Church discipline is done for two people. It's done for the sinner and it's done for the church. It benefits the sinner. It benefits the church. It brings the sinner around to repentance. It protects the integrity of the church. What, it, what all is involved in removing the sinner from the fellowship? To remove the sinner from the fellowship means to also exclude him from the church ordinances. To exclude him from the Lord's Supper. Now let's look at this in verse 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Purge out the old leaven. That ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Christ was our Passover lamb, and he was sacrificed for our sin. Part of the Passover was the unleavened bread. 
Now, you have Passover 2,000 years ago, and you've got Jesus eating the unleavened bread in the upper room with the disciples. That was part of the Passover feast. That was part of the Passover observance. He was giving them the unleavened bread, which he said is his body. His body, pure from sin. Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He said, take, eat, this is my body. Okay? Where was the lamb? Where was the Passover lamb and their Passover supper? The Passover lamb was serving the bread to them. The Passover lamb was sacrificed the following day. So he was our Passover lamb. The unleavened bread, we still observe that because the lamb has been fulfilled. Jesus died for the sins of, of all men of all time. And so the Passover lamb, we don't need the, pass, we don't need the actual lamb anymore because we have the lamb with a capital L. And he sits at the right hand of God and never lives to make intercession for us. But we've got the unleavened bread that we still observe because Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And we observe that with unleavened bread. You look in verse 8. It says, and that's the context of verse 8 here. It says, therefore, let us keep the feast. Which feast? The feast of Passover. But we don't sacrifice the lamb anymore because Jesus fulfilled all that when he was sacrificed. So we keep the feast with the unleavened bread and with the fruit of the vine. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, so don't keep the feast with old leaven. That's your sin or, or the, your old sin or the sin that you repented from when you came to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You're supposed to leave all that behind. Don't keep the feast with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. So don't come up with any new sin and any new wickedness and any new malice to observe the Lord's Supper with. Okay, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Don't observe the Lord's Supper with unrepented sin in your life. Right. If it's time for the Lord's Supper, and you've been having a problem with a sin that you've been involved in, that you have backslidden into, get that settled with God before you come to church that night. And if you haven't got it settled with God, don't take the supper that night. Either don't come, or if you do come, don't partake. And if you don't partake, I'm not going to ask you why. I'm not going to confront you with it. Okay? It's happened more than once in my ministry that somebody in the congregation had, you know, examined themselves and found themselves that they were not in a position to take the Lord's Supper. And I don't call anybody on the carpet for that. Okay? That's between you and God. Now, don't observe the Lord's Supper with sin in your life, but to the church this is an instruction not to serve the Lord's Supper to the unrepentant sinner. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. Now notice that. If any man that is called a brother, that's important. If any man that is called, that means he's a fellow Christian. That means he's a church member. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one not to eat. What are we talking about in this passage? We're talking about keeping the feast. Okay? This has nothing to do with Dairy Queen, or CC's, or any of the other restaurants in town. Now, many people think that this means not to eat lunch with sinners. However, if you're going to lead a sinner to Christ... You're going to have to spend time with them. And you may, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an evangelism tool. I'll buy people lunch. You know, I'll, if there's somebody I know that could use, that I think needs ministry, I'll call them and like, hey, let's go to lunch. And, you know, I'll try to talk to them about Jesus over lunch. I'm not committing a sin in doing that. Verse 10 says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. In other words, if you're not going to associate with people who have sin in their lives, you're going to have to leave the world. But we're sent out into the world as sheep, as sheep, as sheep among wolves. Okay? Jesus sent us out into the world. Now, if we're not going to be anywhere near sin, then we can't go out into the world, which means we can't obey the Great Commission. This is not talking about don't eat lunch with a sinner or with a lost person. Or with somebody that's having some major problems. This is talking about keeping the feast, keeping the, the Lord's Supper. Don't serve this 
to the brother. Notice that. If any man has called a brother, don't serve it to him. If he's a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such a one, not to eat. Don't serve him the Lord's Supper. Why? Because you should have excluded him from the fellowship. You've excluded him from the fellowship, therefore you don't serve the Lord's Supper to him. In verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? It's our responsibility to make sure that we stay on top of this sort of thing. People say, people ex ex look at this and they say, well, this means, you know, don't go out eating lunch with sinners. But Jesus ate with the publicans and the sinners. So it's, I understand how they get the, how they get the interpretation of that. And I, at one time, I thought the same thing about that passage. But when you look at the context, and you look at what Jesus did and the example that he gave us, this, this is talking about the Lord's Supper. Don't serve the Lord's Supper to an unrepentant sinner. Don't take the Lord's Supper if you're an unrepentant sinner. The only unrepentant sinners that we can judge are the ones who are members of this church. Okay, verse 12. What have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. See, this church does not have the authority to examine a non-church member and decide whether or not they're worthy to take the Lord's Supper. Now, we can do that with a church member. We can examine a church member and say that this church member, we, we shouldn't serve the Lord's Supper to them because this church member is an extortioner. This church member is a drunkard. This church member is a railer. A railer, that's railing. I mean, we're talking about throwing a fit. We're talking about the person who stirs the strife and contention in the church, okay? <laughs> we're not supposed to serve the Lord's Supper to them. That's a church discipline issue, okay? The only unrepentant sinners we can judge are the ones who are members of this church. So therefore, the only ones that we have the authority to serve the Lord's Supper to or to withhold the Lord's Supper from are those who are members of this local New Testament church. So when we don't serve the Lord's Supper to a non-member, it's not because we've examined you and deemed you unworthy. It's that we don't have the authority to examine you. And that's all we're saying. We're not saying you're not saved. We're not saying you're not as saved. We're not saying that you haven't gotten into the inner circle that we're in, an, in the inner circle. We just don't have the authority to serve to you. Now, the Bible also says, let each man examine himself, which means if you reach out there and take you a piece of the bread or take you a, a cup of the juice, we're not going to call security or anything. That's, that, that, that's on you. But the practice of this church for these reasons is that we observe a closed communion. The Lord's Supper is it a church ordinance or is it a Christian ordinance? Baptism, is it a church ordinance or a Christian ordinance? If it's a Christian ordinance, you can observe it anywhere if you're a Christian. If baptism were a Christian ordinance and you could baptize somebody on your own the second you led them to Christ without the church or without, the, without anybody knowing about it. But that's not the way we do it. It's a church ordinance. We baptize in the church. The church has the authority to baptize. The Lord's Supper is a church ordinance. If it were not a church ordinance, you'd have the authority as a Christian to go to the hospital to where your friend is and serve your friend the Lord's Supper, just the two of y'all, there at the hospital. But we don't, we don't practice that because it's not a Christian ordinance. It's a church ordinance. And with it being a church ordinance, the church only has the authority to serve it to those who are members of that church.